My name is Amara Yadiu with the PACA Secretariat of the African Union Commission. I will uh, serve as your master of ceremony for this session. It's not food. So the millions of people that consume groundnuts as their daily staple in West Africa have a right to safe food. As we shall hear from many speakers uh, in the coming sessions, aflatoxin has prevented West African region from realizing the potential of groundnut as a source of foreign currency to many countries, as well as as a source of income and wealth to the ordinary citizens. We also came to Senegal because, because of all of what I said so far, and also specifically because of the commitment of Senegal to deal with this vexing problem head on. For that reason, actually, Senegal is one of the six PACA focus countries in Africa that we support very closely. To say a few words about the workshop, first and foremost, this workshop recognizes the value of partnerships. While government is central to control aflatoxins effectively, private sector should play important roles and hopefully that will come very clearly in the coming two days. Also, we recognize that what we need is sustained efforts to make the system work better. And so we hope that we will agree on flagship projects that we will be able to implement for the coming years together to achieve some change uh, to, re to revive the ground and value chains. Lastly, this, let us address the groundnut aflatoxin problem in a meaningful way and create a momentum to address other challenges. Let's think the millions of lives that we can rehabilitate in our deliberations for the coming two days. So with those brief remarks, I now kindly invite and welcome Dr. Chris Muyonda, the representative of PANAC, to make some remarks. Thank you for your kind attention. Dr. Janet Edeme, officer in charge, Rural Economy and Agriculture, the African Union. Uh, Dr. Kenton uh, Dasho, Director Gen Deputy Director General, IITA. Um, Mr. Dogosek, the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Agriculture, Republic of Senegal. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Damirola, Director, Agriculture. My colleague, uh, NST, I'll be representative uh, of the economic community of 
West African states. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the steering committee, the PACA secretariat, good morning once again. I'm going to deliver a speech on behalf of the chief executive officer of the Pan-African Agribusiness Agro-Industry Consortium, uh, Mrs. Lucy Muchoki, who do co due to conflicting programs has not been able to make it to this meeting this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, as a representative of the African private sector, it is my great pleasure to join you at this exciting workshop on aflatoxin mitigation in the groundnut value chain in West Africa. I join everybody else today, the government and people of Senegal, for hosting us here, for hosting all of us, the Parker Secretariat, ECOWAS, CORAF, IITA, ICRISAT, and other partners in planning this workshop. The Pan-African Agribusiness and Agro-Industry Consortium is a regional agribusiness network that promotes African agribusinesses through enhanced productivity and competitiveness in the national, regional, and global markets. We work extensively with farmers and farm organizations with small and medium-sized enterprises across the African continent. I do not have to tell you that the people of Africa are ingenious. They are ingenious and resourceful, and they have an entrepreneurial spirit at heart. As Dr. Murray has already indicated, and as we shall hear in more detail, the aflatoxin problem has had major impacts on groundnut exports from West Africa. But we also hear that groundnuts continue to be important ingredients of the staple foods consumed by our people. The reality is that our farmers and groundnut processors supply groundnuts, oil and flour to local and regional markets. We know that these markets are not well reg regulated and food safety is not well monitored. When we speak of opportunities for the private sector, we need to keep in mind who the entrepreneurs and small business people are and what areas they operate in within the groundnut value chain. The private sector are farmers in our communities. They are traders, they are shippers that help move the groundnut crop, they are the women, they are the men who operate small sharers or who run small businesses producing groundnut oil and other groundnut products. We are speaking of thousands of small enterprises across West Africa and indeed across the entire African continent. I look forward to hearing about the many experiences about managing aflatoxin in the groundnut value chain. For instance, we are going to hear about experiences by the National Small Farmers Association of Malawi, whose CEO is here, who are working with smallholder farmers who are once again exporting groundnuts to premium markets in Europe. We are also going to hear from the National Food Security for Marketing Corporation, which is organizing the groundnut value chain in the Gambia. We are also going to hear from Mars International, which manages global food supply chains. Our Honorable Representative of the African Union, distinguished guests, to support African businesses, we need a coordinated approach, a coordinated approach that includes items such as developing national and regional groundnut strategies, implementing integrated aflatoxin management strategies, encouraging regulatory measures to control the flow of contaminated shipments in national and international trade. We need to ensure we establish certified quality control laboratories, and we need to promote exports through market prospecting and generic promotion of national products. 
as we share our many experiences in this workshop and forge ahead to create a roadmap for action, I urge all of us to apply the lessons that we shall learn to create models and business plans for aflatoxin management that will work for the many small businesses in the groundnut value chain in West Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity to help African small businesses flourish and see that the entrepreneurs' families prosper. Without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all. Thank you very much. I'd like to challenge all of us that, uh, that let's say, I'd give us a five-year time frame that, that we should set some goals that within five years, and I'm going to, not going to say what it should be in five years, but we should be able to come back in five years and say, this is the group of people that laid the ground floor, the plan for revitalizing groundnut industry in West Africa. And we can see the achievements we made and the, and the failures, the, the, the challenges that we faced that we didn't quite get right. Oh, uh, sorry, please let me stand on all uh, protocol observed. As an American, sometimes I forget all those things. Uh, but uh, sorry about that. Let me stand on all protocols observed. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring you greetings from the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA, in Ibadan, Nigeria. And I'd like to uh, join the preceding speakers in thanking the government and the people of Senegal for hosting us in this regional workshop on revamping the groundnut value chain of West Africa through aflatoxin mitigation. I would like to commend the efforts of PACA, Secretariat, and her steering committee for organizing this workshop, more especially the privilege to present these remarks this morning. The institute that I re represent, IITA, has a strong research for development program on aflatoxin. And we have been conducting a lot of work on improving food safety and security in Nigeria, in West Africa, and throughout the African continent. I am therefore elated to see the synergistic effects, sorry, efforts of ECOWAS member states towards prioritizing this very serious problem that needs to be addressed through a comprehensive and multi-sectorial approach. And I want to emphasize that comprehensive and multi-sectorial approach. For us to have success, real success, in revitalizing the groundnut industry, we have to have a real team effort. So groundnut, as we all know, is one of the most susceptible crops to aflatoxin. And when this is coupled with the current production storage and processing uh, techniques used by most small-scale farmers here in West Africa, this tends to aggravate the contamination situation even more. In the past, there was a heavy reliance on groundnut value chain for income and foreign exchange, employment and consumption in West Africa. For example, in Gambia, they used to attribute 60% of their earnings from agriculture export to groundnut. In Senegal, this figure was 80%. And this is not the case today, as we all know, because at least one of the major factors causing the decline has been aflatoxin. For example, we used to see groundnut pyramids in Kano, in Nigeria. There are no more. And um, the World Bank has estimated that if somehow we could reduce this uh, aflatoxin problem with groundnut in Senegal alone, we could increase income earnings in the country by $300 million each year. Also, as we know, aflatoxin is not only an economic impact, but it has a huge impact on the lives of people, on their health, especially children. And recently there was a study conducted by a group of researchers from Senegal, from IITA, from Queen's University in Belfast, the University of Leeds, 
And what it showed was that the aflatoxin exposure for, the, for this group of people in Senegal was high in general, and that the correlation of aflatoxin exposure was, was, there was a, sorry, there was a high correlation between exposure and amount of groundnut consumption. Just, it builds on more and more evidence that, we, that we've seen in recent years. Let me at this time uh, mention that uh, there is many ways to control uh, aflatoxin, and we're going to be talk discussing many of those today, but one of them I want to highlight is a product called Aflasafe. This is a biological control product developed jointly by IITA and the USDA ARS, University of Arizona, and with partners in every country where we develop uh, uh, Aflasafe. For example, in Nigeria, we developed it with the University of Ibadan, et cetera, et cetera, in every country we go to. Now, this has proven to be a very useful and cost-effective for drastic reduction of aflatoxin contamination in groundnut and maize. And this works in pre-harvest through post-harvest. The biological control technology affords farmers the opportunity to practically engage and partner in aflatoxin mitigation efforts around the continent. Although the aflatoxin problem has negatively impacted the groundnut value chain in West Africa for, dec for decades, we have not been able to seize back the former success. This is mainly because efforts aimed at revamping groundnut sector, including aflatoxin mitigation efforts, have been decentralized, uncoordinated, and scattered, such that the impacts are not heavily felt. That's what we're here all about here uh, this week, to make a coordinated effort. So we need to be looking at efforts in related to soil management, planting of quality seeds, and other good agronomic practices, use and adoption of biological control, control technologies, enhancing farmer, processor, and consumer knowledge about aflatoxins, good storage practices and conditions, creating safe alternatives, uses for contaminated kernels, establishing market incentives, and enabling policies. And these all need to be uh, very well coordinated. I think I should also mention we need members of the media and the press to be with us to help expose our ideas to everyone. And we're so glad that uh, we're having a strong contingent of the press people here today. Ladies and gentlemen, over the next two days, we need to address each of these issues, as I have highlighted already, and other speakers will highlight, so that we can ensure aflatoxin control and the availability of groundnuts that are safe to eat. If we do this together, we'll realize the goal for which we are all gathered here today. And that goal is to revamp the groundnut value chain through aflatoxin mitigation. Revamping the groundnut value chain in West Africa is achievable. We can do it. Together, we can greatly, greatly multiply the, um, the international trade and safe use of groundnuts right here at home. Um, once again, I want to emphasize, let's work together as a team. We can't overlook any subsector of the groundnut ground value chain if we are be, to be successful. I wish us all successful, dibler, dibler, <laughs> sorry, successful deliberations. Thank you very much. Here, the representative of the CEO of PANAC, representative of Meridian Institute, representative of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, representatives of development partners, USAID, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and all others, representative of agricultural research institutes, IITA, ICRISAT, CORAF, ILRI, and all others present here, senior government officials of the government of Senegal and all other ECOWAS member states, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I stand here representing the Commissioner for Agriculture, Environment, and Water Resources, Dr. Lapodini Makatuga, who officially is on leave and is not able to uh, be here today in this uh, very important meeting. I will proceed to read uh, the prepared speech on behalf of the Equals Commission. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a singular honor and pleasure for me to address on behalf of the ECOWAS Commission this important regional workshop on revamping the groundnut value chain of West Africa through aflatoxin mitigation. I bring you special greetings to all delegates from the President of the ECOWAS Commission, His Excellency Mr. Kadri Desiree Wadrago, who appreciates the work of the Partnership for Aflatoxin Control in Africa as a practical initiative in addressing the food security challenges in ECOWAS member states. Distinguished delegates, the organization of this regional workshop on revamping the groundnut value chain of West Africa through aflatoxin mitigation could not have come at a better time in the developmental strides of the ECOWAS member states. The importance of groundnut in the national economies of the ECOWAS member states cannot be overemphasized. The groundnut value chain has been an important aspect of national economies since colonial period to date. The region has been a leading producer of groundnut for the international market, with countries such as Nigeria and Senegal accounting for 45% of total African production. Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Gambia are also main producers of groundnut and groundnut products. At the peak of production of groundnut, it was a common feature to see groundnut pyramids constructed in northern Nigeria, to be specific, Kanu, uh, groundnut barges in the River Gambia, and buying points for groundnuts scattered all over um, West Africa. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, the groundnut sector in colonial and early independence period in West Africa has always been a source of food, income, employment, foreign exchange earning, and also livelihoods. The, the, situation cannot be, the situation cannot be said to be the same in 2015. The groundnut sector has witnessed steady decline. The reasons for the decline in groundnut production are due to so many factors, such as environmental, economical, biological, and political, amongst others. The presence of aflatoxin in the ECWAS member states has been a contributive factor to the decline of, groundnut, of the groundnut industry. Scientific studies have shown that there are high frequencies of aflatoxin in Senegal, Nigeria, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Gambia, and Sierra Leone, and by extension in all other ECOWAS member states. Suggesting that all ECOWAS member states are endemic with toxin-producing strains. Groundnut and groundnut products are said to be very susceptible to aflatoxin. This situation poses grave dangers to the attainment of food security, promotion of regional and, interna and international trade, and the protection of human health. The challenges of aflatoxin in the groundnut value chain and other crop and livestock value chains is now considered as a developmental challenge which requires collective efforts by all stakeholders within the region and from outside. It is in this light that the ECOWAS Commission appreciates and supports the effort of the African Union Commission through PACA in addressing the challenges of aflatoxin in West Africa and the rest of the African continent. The, the PACA ECOWAS partnership has enabled, to, has enabled the region to put in place mitigation efforts on aflatoxin and also has made aflatoxin a priority issue in the food security and national development agendas of the region and the member states. The results of this innovative partnership has produced very good uh, milestones in the pilot countries of Senegal, Gambia, and Nigeria. The ECOWAS Commission would like to appeal for additional financial and technical support from development partners for PACA pilot activities to cover all the 15 ECOWAS member states. In addressing the aflatoxin menace in groundnuts, in addressing the aflatoxin menace in groundnuts will be a major contribution towards the reforms and revitalization and revitalization programs taking place in a number of countries in West Africa. In a situation where African countries are losing uh, 450, 450 to $670 million as a result of aflatoxin contamina contamination requires urgent national, regional, and continental actions. The livelihood of farmers and national economies are facing major threats. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, 
It is therefore important that we take urgent steps in preventing the harmful effects of aflatoxin in taking roots in our region. There is the need to seriously undertake the following. One, investments in human capacity development. Two, development of reliable, accessible, and affor affordable technologies. Here, we are very pleased and happy with the initiatives of IITA in developing the AFLASAFE technology. Three, investment in laboratories and required infrastructure. Improvements in compliance, surveillance, enforcement, and standard issues. Number five, sensitization of populations on the strategy for the, prevent for, for the prevention and mitigation of uh, aflatoxin in our respective member states. And the sixth point is harmonization of existing laws and regulations at the national, regional, and continental levels. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, the ECOWAS, the ECOWAS Commission will continue to support all initiatives to mitigate aflatoxin in the groundnut value chain and other agricultural value chains in West Africa. We express our sincere appreciation to all our partners for the work they, they have been doing uh, on aflatoxin control and mitigation in West Africa. This includes the ECOWAS member states themselves, um, the African Union Commission, PACA, IITA, IITA CORAF, ICRISAT, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Meridian Institute, USAID, Depart US Department of Agriculture, and indeed our farmers' organizations in West Africa, such as RUPA. In conclusion, the President of the ECOWAS Commission, His Excellency uh, Kadri Desiree Wadgogo, conveys his appreciation to His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Senegal, Mr. Makisal, the government and the friendly people of Senegal, a, non, a land known for hospitality and, in short, Taranga, for accepting to host this important regional workshop, which will have a far-reaching effect on the groundnut value chain, not only for West Africa, but by extension, the entire African continent. Uh, we thank the, the government and people of Senegal for according all the delegates to this workshop, the exceptional Senegalese hospitality. I wish you all a successful deliberation, and I thank you for your kind attention. May God bless you all.
then the most debilitating effect of Nigeria grand launch in the mid 1970s was government intervention, full deployment of resistant varieties, cultivars, economy. The Nigerian government has aligned with the effort of the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture to give with them. I think, and it's close, they must have done that. That development products are passive, but more than that, based farmers. So we tend to also leverage this grand launch. Based stakeholders were all brought together into this. And at the same farm level, as the Sipaculate, and support at continental level, as recognized by the A government for its concerns and promotional efforts to cover the lineage of African countries. This pack appears in five countries, including Malawi, Senegal, Tanzania, and Uganda, in contamination. The Federal Minister of Agriculture and Development is now coordinating an interministerial technique that we have to work with them. The Nigerian Canal Valuation Program of October 80 before seminary tropics in research has played a major role. In this point, university. Other components of value chain includes those that have the comparative advantage in the production of grant. Two commission of grant um, business group in Nigeria today, and they're doing a lot. The production technology for at least 180,000 farmers. The production of 2,000 metric tons of quality seed of the pro varieties of grammar formal informacy production system. We started two production systems in the country. During the dry season, which is now crop granola and crop rice in the extensive. At this point, the food technology of ground extension agents in the food production and processing technologies, as well as participatory mission, as epitomized by what it is to do with us. This project will support the development of effective and easy to perform. This tool has enabled Malawi, Wino, to resume the relevant Nigerian institutions to scale up the best fed technologies to control our processes in food and feed. The success of the Nigerian granola value chain is dependent on partnership, like Dr. Dashir, Dr. Agricultural Research Area, Nigerian Agricultural Research Extension, and Agricultural Research Institutes in the country. The National Agricultural Research continues to support to pay the enormous standard for improved granola industry in the country. Dr. Dashir, one who has just now, I urge producing content focused to realize our expectations, which has succeeded in our endeavors using the purposes of people. I thank you. Thank you, Thus, Nigeria's perspective, also for highlighting the potential of groundnuts in the country. I think as Nigeria's commitment to address the nuts challenge, um, actually highlighting strong ongoing efforts. Thank you for those remarks. So next, I welcome Dr. Johnny Tetame, the officer in charge of rural economy and agriculture of the EU Commission, to give us some remarks. Economies of Africa by revamping the granite value chain of West Africa. On behalf of the African Union Commission, I also wish to present our com compliments through you, Secretary, to His Excellency President Makisal, the government, and the friendly people of the Republic of Senegal for granting the hosting rights and the enabling environment to conduct our business since our arrival in Senegal a few days ago. The African Union Commission would also like to commend the leadership and commitment of ECOWAS in facilitating the organization of this workshop together with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture and the Pan-African Agribusiness and Agro-Industry Consortium for co-hosting this momentous event. I would also like to recognize the presence and support of our key partners from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, from the USAID, and from DFID in encouraging the efforts towards the control of aflatoxins through the support of the continent-wide program known as the Partnership for Aflatoxin Control as they continue to contribute to the hearts of Africa's economic growth and food security. It is also with great pleasure that I'm here in Senegal as the incoming chair of the PACA steering committee representing the African Union Commission. And the steering committee will be taking place from the 3rd to the 4th of this month here in Dakar. The PACA steering committee has continued to provide the leadership and strategic guidance that the continent requires at this time on mitigating aflatoxins in Africa. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, groundnut is one of the most susceptible crops to aflatoxins. Since the 1960s, groundnut production and exports from the West African region has been declining 
mostly due to aflatoxin contamination of groundnuts and groundnut products. Indeed, each year, it is estimated that the African continent loses between 450 to 670 million US dollars in lost exports due to aflatoxins. According to the World Bank in 2013, reducing aflatoxin contamination could potentially add nearly 300 million US dollars annually to the Senegalese groundnut exports alone. Many countries in this region are also facing similar challenges with aflatoxin. In most West African countries, groundnut is an important cash crop, employing nearly 70% of the active workforce. In addition to its vital economic role, groundnuts are also an integral part of most of the West African countries' culture and ways of life, whether in terms of labor specialization or culinary taste. And that is why today, on behalf of the African Union Commission, we are pleased to see the regional economic communities, our African Union member states, the private sector, farmers' organizations, and our development partners, civil society, and other key stakeholders taking a collective decision to reclaim the once thriving and vibrant ground value chain of West Africa. Indeed, this decision to take concrete action is in line with decisions by our African Union heads of states through the Malabo Declaration which called on Africans to start walking the walk and delivering results and impacts. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. In June of last year, the heads of state and government of the African Union met in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea, to reinforce their commitments to move Africa towards integration and prosperity by transforming agriculture through the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, also known as CADEP. In this, their 2014 Malabo Declaration, the African Union heads of state and government committed themselves over the next 10 years, among other things, to boost or triple intra-African trade in agricultural goods and services. This particular commitment can only be realized if non-tariff barriers, particularly technical barriers related to food safety, sanitary and phytosanitary issues, such as aflatoxins, are addressed proactively. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Unless we begin to address aflatoxins, we will not be able to triple intra-Africa trade in agriculture. So I wish to therefore commend the decision to convene this workshop in order to begin to consultatively and inclusively develop strategies and prioritize actions through a concrete roadmap that will revamp the groundnut value chain of West Africa and ultimately contribute to the attainment of the Malabo Declaration. I wish us all a successful stay in, in Dakar, Senegal, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Permettez-moi tout d'abord, au nom de Dr. Pap Abdoulaisek, ministre de l'Agriculture et de l'Équipement Rural du Sénégal, mais aussi au nom du gouvernement, de vous souhaiter la bienvenue en terre sénégalaise. Mon plaisir est d'autant plus grand que nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui pour parler d'une problématique doublement importante. Nous sommes venus pour parler de la recherche. Nous sommes aussi venus pour parler de l'aflatoxine, problématiques qui sont extrêmement importantes pour le Sénégal, pour lesquelles le Sénégal a une expérience et c'est pour cela que vous avez bien choisi le pays d'accueil de cette réunion. Distingués invités, mesdames et messieurs, la chaîne de valeur de la Rachid est une des chaînes de valeur les plus importantes au Sénégal. Comme vous le savez, la rachide est une culture non seulement alimentaire, mais aussi une culture sociale et une culture économique. Elle occupe une bonne partie de la population, près de 80%, mais aussi contribue grandement à la génération des revenus pour les producteurs, mais aussi à la génération de recettes d'exportation pour notre pays. Pendant les années 60, le Sénégal a été parmi les pays, les principaux pays producteurs, mais aussi exportateurs. Et je dois aussi le dire pour des raisons historiques, le Sénégal est un pays pionnier dans la recherche sur la recherche parce que le Sénégal abrite le Centre national de la recherche agronomique de Bambé, connu sous le nom de Centre de recherche pour l'Afrique de l'Ouest, l'Afrique occidentale française créé depuis les années 1928 et comme vous le savez, à partir duquel 
ont été créés la plupart des variétés d'arachides cultivées en Afrique, mais aussi cultivées au-delà de l'Afrique, en Argentine et même aux États-Unis. C'est donc un pays qui a une tradition, une longue tradition, mais aussi une euh, longue expérience en matière d'arachides dans toute sa chaîne de valeur, comme je reviendrai tout à l'heure. Pour revenir sur la flatoxine, c'est une problématique extrêmement importante parce qu'au-delà de son impact sanitaire sur la santé des hommes mais aussi des animaux, la flatoxine est un obstacle aux exportations. C'est une barrière non tarifaire puisqu'il fait l'objet de normes pour le commerce international de la recherche. C'est pour cela l'étude qui a été commanditée par le PACA, qui sera présentée plus tard dans la journée, vous permettra de voir le fardeau que constitue la flatoxine à cause de son impact sur l'économie de nos pays, mais aussi sur la santé des hommes et des animaux. Je voudrais juste rappeler que, d'après des estimations de la Banque mondiale, une réduction de la contamination par la flatoxine pourrait ajouter plus de 300 millions de dollars par an aux exportations d'arachides. C'est pour expliquer l'impact, en tout cas l'intérêt de réduire l'incidence de, ce, de, ce, de, ce, de, ce, de cette toxine. Mesdames, Mesdemoiselles, Messieurs, chers invités, il est aussi très heureux de savoir que la Commission de l'Union africaine, à travers le PACA, a choisi le Sénégal comme l'un des pays pilotes pour la mise en œuvre des mesures de contrôle de la flatoxine dans nos pays. Ce programme pilote va aider, nous le pensons, l'ensemble des pays, en tout cas à réduire les risques, mais aussi à avoir un plan national de, la, de réduction et de contrôle de la flatoxine qui va être suivi d'une feuille de route qui va être déroulée pour l'intérêt de nos pays. C'est pour cela le Sénégal comme les autres pays qui ont pris la parole et qui m'ont précédé, et en tout cas ouvert à contribuer à la mise en œuvre de ce plan d'action et à l'intégrer dans la conception de ces programmes et de ces politiques. Je parlais tout à l'heure de l'expérience du Sénégal en matière d'arachide, mais aussi en matière d'agriculture de manière générale. Je m'en vais maintenant, en tout cas, vous la présenter pour la mettre, en tout cas, euh, aux réflexions que vous allez utiliser dans cet atelier. Comme vous le savez, au Sénégal, l'agriculture constitue une priorité de premier plan, priorité qui a été déclinée dans le plan Sénégal émergent, et notamment dans l'axe 1, euh, qui a été déroulé dans le programme d'accélération de la cadence de l'agriculture sénégalaise, conçu par le ministre de l'Agriculture et actuellement d'être mis en œuvre. Dans ce programme d'accélération de la cadence de l'agriculture sénégalaise, la Russie constitue une des filières prioritaires parce qu'il est visé pour l'horizon 2017 une production de 1 million de tonnes de la Russie, mais aussi un objectif à l'horizon 2017 d'exporter 100 à 150 000 tonnes de Russie sur l'international. Dans cette conception de l'agriculture au Sénégal, le président veut que l'agriculture soit productive, qu'elle soit compétitive, qu'elle soit durable. Il veut aussi que l'agriculture génère des emplois, mais aussi que l'agriculture génère des revenus pour les producteurs, mais aussi pour le pays, notamment à travers les exportations. C'est pour cela que dans la mise en œuvre de cette vision, au ministère de l'Agriculture et de l'Équipement Rural, nous pensons que cette agriculture doit être conçue autrement, qu'elle doit être planifiée autrement, qu'elle doit être exécutée autrement, qu'elle doit être suivie et évaluée autrement. Autrement, notamment par des ruptures, ces ruptures passent notamment par le partenariat, tel que vous l'avez dit, tel que vous l'avez dit tous. Un partenariat au niveau national entre toutes les institutions mais aussi entre tous les acteurs qui interviennent autour d'une chaîne de valeur, nous parlons ici d'Arachide, et il est heureux de constater que dans cette salle, il y a des acteurs, l'ensemble des acteurs de la chaîne de valeur. Il y a les institutions de recherche, il y a le secteur privé, il y a les producteurs, il y a les transformateurs, et il y a aussi les exportateurs. Je pense qu'en cela, vous êtes parfaitement en phase 
avec cette conception d'ouverture et de partenariat à tous les niveaux. Nous pensons aussi que cette agriculture, pour atteindre ses objectifs, doit être conçue en intégrant les innovations technologiques. Pour augmenter la productivité, il faut en effet des technologies de pointe, il faut des variétés performantes, il faut des itinéraires techniques adaptés, il faut un équipement rural adapté pour la production, pour la transformation, mais aussi pour la conservation des produits. Il faut enfin des technologies pour générer des méthodes adaptées. On parle ici de réduction de la flatoxine et notamment pour intégrer la nécessité de durabilité de l'agriculture. Il faut des techniques alternatives autres que chimiques. Nous parlons ici de maîtriser la flatoxine, notamment par des techniques de lutte biologique mais de manière générale par des itinéraires techniques adaptés. C'est donc toute la pertinence, en tout cas, de, ce, de la problématique, des réflexions qui sont menées, et pour dire qu'en cela, le Sénégal est tout à fait ouvert à contribuer. Vous intégrez enfin la triptyque que l'agriculture, la santé et l'environnement est une triptyque qui est, indis qui est indispensable d'intégrer et de prendre en compte dans toutes les réflexions et dans tous les programmes projets. C'est vraiment sur cette note, sur l'expérience sénégalaise, son plaisir de vous accueillir, que je déclare ouvert au nom de M. le ministre de l'Agriculture, au nom du gouvernement du Sénégal, en tout cas ouvert cet atelier, en restant très attentif, en tout cas aux résultats qui vont en sortir, avec la possibilité, nos représentants ici présents dans cette salle, vous diront aussi qu'en matière de plateau technique, le Sénégal, pour le contrôle de la ressource destinée à l'exploitation, a des institutions et a des laboratoires adaptés et équipés. Nous avons, pour ne pas les citer, le Centre régional de recherche en écotoxicologie et sécurité environnementale, qui est un laboratoire accrédité à la norme ISO 17025 dans le domaine 6. Nous avons l'Institut de technologie alimentaire de Dakar, qui a une très grande expérience en matière d'analyse du taux d'aflatoxine par des techniques chromatographiques par HPLC. Nous avons enfin la direction de la protection des végétaux, ici présente, qui a participé à la préparation de l'atelier et à sa mise en œuvre pour le contrôle des normes sanitaires et phytosanitaires, mais aussi un laboratoire très adapté, nous le savons, en parfaite synergie avec l'Institut international d'agriculture tropicale et toutes les institutions présentes. Donc, autant de structures sans parler de nos exportateurs, nous avons l des organisations de producteurs ici présents dans la salle qui s'inscrivent dans une dynamique d'exporter la Russie en Europe, au, au, en Chine, mais aussi partout dans le monde et qui s'inscrivent dans cette démarche qualité pour que la Russie du Sénégal réponde aux normes pour que l'origine Sénégal soit préservée pour enfin que la Russie, à travers ses différentes fonctions que j'ai déclinées, réponde à tous les objectifs. C'est sur ces mots que je déclare ouvert l'atelier en vous souhaitant des travaux fructueux. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Sometimes the public sector and the private sector may not understand each other quite well. But I think we'll come up in terms of civil society and NGOs. How many farmers are in the room? Problem starts with you, but I want to say that.
I here. I'm sure there are amongst us here. I've been seeing cameramen and telling us about that special category. Okay. Now, we have a meeting. We've come from far and wide. Some of us have flown all the way from out of Africa. We have spent the time we have together in the morning. It's only two days. You are going to have time to do your emails and do other things, but you may not have these people with you. Uh, that I want to share with you, uh, that I hope we can use to have a more that we sometimes use as, as people in South Africa. One of them is informality. What it means is you can walk out and go to the washrooms at any time, quietly, so that time, feel free, yeah? But that's fine, I, we all respect that, but if we feel that that's going to make it difficult for us to communicate, just let it come, inclusiveness. So everyone has something important to share. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So let's have constructive controversy. Mm -hmm. Be controversial if you're making a point, mm -hmm. not to enjoy the controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, creativity, thinking, let me not say outside, being always the usual business as usual type of, mm -hmm. of suggestions. Let's think, be, yeah, just share. Defensiveness can be a problem sometimes. It's clear that uh, common, we are a mixed group, so we can communicate effectively. Those values and principles are up there. Um, one other quick thing, we'll have a lot of work at STEM, uh, and we have had our expectations. But some big, uh, be conscious about time management, we are running short of time. Avoid distractions, the agenda for this meeting. It outlines what we are going to do. It's written both in English and we will be guiding you through that process. Um, the objectives are in there, but they are also in the concept note and other places. I don't want to go through them. Uh, I just want to say that with that, and because of time, I want to move to the next session. That was session address uh, from colleagues, both uh, from uh, session to put a context to this whole aflatoxin in groundnuts issue. Yeah? And there's going to be three groundnuts, past, present, and future. Huh. Huh? So that's the challenge to the groundnut sector. Uh, bring it a little bit lower to the challenge in West Africa. Huh? The other one contextualizes the history, the evolution of sort of Nigeria and Senegal. Uh, and a group has put that together, but one of them is going to make the presentation. Now, uh, Richard and colleagues, we are going to have a very tight time timing. I will put up a yellow card when you have three minutes left, and I will put up a red card when it's time to stop. Yeah? Just because of time. Uh, but we will then move to the next presentation and the next. So three in a row. Please. If you have comments, questions, issues to discuss, we will have a key. Let me say that, before I go, let me say that Brown originated from South America. And the Portuguese and the Spanish supposedly took it to Europe. And it came to West Africa by the Portuguese, probably through slave trade. But there are two basic types of groundhog. The Virginia type. Groundhog has many uses. It can be used as food. So, while working together in the last two days, uh, we have exchanged ideas, we had to exchange our expert expertise, we came up with our action areas. But we will work with all of you in the coming months to put these action areas into something concrete. These action areas actually was a little us in it in terms of coming up with sustainable um, you know, implementation of things. Not episodic, fragmented, uh, you know, many projects here and there. So I think in that regard, this workshop it was a great success for, for all of us. Um, so having said, said that, um, let me say that uh, this workshop wouldn't have been uh, possible, at least it wouldn't have been as the way it was without the task force members who actually supported the planning of everything. So, I you mentioned the organizations in the opening, 
but I would like to recognize people by name. Uh, now, the task force members. From IIT, uh, I use Robert's uh, recommendation and just use first names. I will not use doctor uh, and myself and so on. So from IIT, I came. Uh, maybe the task force members, if they stand up, I humbly ask them to stand up. Ken, uh, Ramajit, Mark, Saido from USAID, is he still with us? So please help me thank uh, this gentleman. It's a very gentle, it's cute uh, task force. <laughs> I would like to thank the legal team, uh, Robert and Philip, who facilitated this workshop, who supported us in the whole process effectively, and also who kept us in focus on target whenever discussions might go might, might astray. So, Robert and Philip, thank you so much. Please join me in the time. <laughs> also, the Panta City Committee members. Out of 14 city committee members, we have six uh, among us. So this is a huge sign of support. Uh, and uh, the, as usual, the city committee can lead to leadership. And uh, so we, we do not take that for granted. And so, so that many people don't have to stand in game, I'll just uh, name uh, the city committee members who are amongst us. So uh, Janet from AUC. Ernest from ECOAS, uh, Chris from ANAC, Ranajit from IIT, and Orn from the Gates Foundation, and Sego will also sit for, for uh, his hand. So we thank also the city committee members and please happily thank them. Uh, on which of some major things that you have uh, proposed, uh, and you through the, the next step very quickly. So we will we'll include all workshop participants in the PACA community list with all contacts of the participants. By 30th September, we will share the draft uh, meeting reports, the workshop report, as well as the comments. And then we will in incorporate all your good comments uh, and the class commission and of course involving other volunteers who work in, in the Air Task Force. So, Likewise, we'll incorporate the comments to working together with ECOS Commission. Then, regarding the flagship projects, uh, we hope we'll summarize this, what we call by end of the month again. And then, uh, the perhaps we have to convene conference call or some kind of uh, meeting uh, to think about the uh, implementation of these, these flagship projects. And then, more concretely, will projects, and uh, that should be, uh, I think, that they don't get uh, just they don't be shelved and uh, other rather perhaps will be uh, taking place next year and uh, all of the factors uh, towards the second part of the, the year uh, in 2016. So with that, uh, let me then invite the panel that will close the meeting. So again, I will use first names. Uh, so Janet. So actually, these panel members, they will just, uh, you know, perspectives. So starting with Lutzer, then followed by.
raw materials that go into industry are no longer considered as commodities where it is only price that is determining what must be bought or what must not be bought. And also making Africa consume very bad products. And that's why. To take it from there, I always give the food security equation. When you talk